our panel uh, for this session. Abhinav Chaturvedi, partner at Axel Partners. Anath Narayan, founder at Mensa Brands. G.V. Ravi Shankar, managing director at Sequoia Capital. And Rishika Chandan from Venturi Partners. Uh, over to you, Abhinav, to moderate this session. Well, thank you, Abhishek. Thanks, James. That was a, a very insightful presentation. Uh, you know, as Abhishek pointed out, I'm Abhinav, partner at Excel. Uh, I'm going to moderate a panel which talks about uh, the digital economy today. And we'll also uh, give a window into the future. On the panel with me, we have uh, you know, three people, uh, GB uh, from Sequoia, uh, we have Rishika from Venturi Partners, and we have Anant uh, from Mensa Brands. Maybe a quick round of introduction, and we'll start with GB. Sure. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. My name is GB Ravishankar. I'm a partner at Sequoia Capital, and I'm the growth business, invest across technology and consumer things. Thanks, GB. What GB doesn't say is he's among the you know top growth investors in India. Uh, he's uh, achieved uh, the Midas Touch Award uh, in, the, in the ET um, you know startup awards in 2020. Uh, some of his companies are valued uh, above 10 billion dollars, and some of them are on the way to become more than 10 billion dollars. Uh, thanks, GB, for being here. Uh, Anant, maybe a quick introduction. Sure. Hi, Anant Narayanan. Um... I'm a I'm founder of Mensa Brands. Mensa is trying to sort of create a tech-led house of brands from India uh, for the globe. Before this, I used to be at Medlife, and before that, I was at Mintra, and prior to that, at McKinsey. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Anant. Anant's been at the forefront of creating brands in India. Um, Axel, you know, we are delighted to be partners, partnering with him again uh, in, in the journey of Mensa Brands. Thanks, Anant. Rishika, quick, quick short introduction, please. Sure, Abhinav. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rishika from Venturi Partners. Um, we're a consumer-focused growth stage fund. Um, we invest in consumer brands in India and Southeast Asia. Uh, very excited to be here today. Thank you, Rishika. Uh, I've known Rishika for a while. Uh, you know, very, very easy to connect with. You know, some of you folks in the audience wants to talk to an investor. Rishika is one of the go-to people to talk to for the consumer brand space. Well, Starting off, uh, we don't have a lot of time. We're running a little bit behind. So I'll try and make this a little bit faster uh, and make it more conversation so that there is more you know, meaning out of this conversation. Maybe start with GV. GV, just laying the state of the union a little bit. Um, you know, We have seen the second wave of COVID. Uh, maybe just give us a little bit of flavor from what you see from your Sequoia portfolio, how, how things are and you know, some of the low lights and some of the highlights uh, you know, the last two years. Uh, absolutely, Abhinav. Thank you. Um, so look, when uh, we all went into a lockdown uh, in March of last year, it felt like the world was falling apart. And, uh, you know, we were pleasantly surprised at the resilience the companies had shown uh, right after the lockdowns ended at least. So if you think of uh, wave one versus wave two, wave one was really, you know, uh, not as much a healthcare disaster as wave two has been. Um, uh, and so wave one was really about just making sure you survive the lockdown, you know, and then supply, uh, once supply came back, demand started coming back fairly quickly. So we saw a very sharp recovery. And clearly uh, when, you know, the offline businesses were shut, the big beneficiaries were the digital businesses, which somewhat continues in wave two, but like a little bit more moderated, you know. Um, I think the wave one, come, wave one prepared and at least uh, showed the world that uh, you got to be more digital first. So a lot more people were more digitally kind of, let's say prepared by wave two. But wave two has been a completely different, uh, you know, situation where several uh, companies, uh, their employees, etc., were affected. So this was not a supply situation. This was really even demand being hurt because of uh, basic healthcare issues. So across the portfolio, we did see some uh, of those healthcare issues driving kind of uh, execution bottlenecks uh, in the companies. You know, many companies had 10, 15 percent of their uh, sales. I mean, so employee force. Uh, down with COVID or had uh, families affected by COVID. So we really did have a hard problem in hand. And, you know, we were all trying to help uh, everyone as much as uh, we could. Um, but that said, you know, uh, the, the core theme remains, which is, you know, digital adoption and the acceleration of that, which James uh, spoke about, you know, for India, maybe it's three years. But in some of the sectors where we just didn't see light at the end of the day, you know, so much more adoption is happening so much quicker. Like to give you some examples, which are less spoken about, let's say something like agriculture and uh, ability for for us to reach out to farmers and and have a kind of a almost a company having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and a channel with them directly 
uh, that has gotten super uh, you know accelerated now you know what the government has done with uh, vaccine registration on covid etc is only going to make sure that more people are becoming more friendly with respect to apps and not you know are kind of learning the ropes on how to make it happen uh, so i do think uh, this whole digital penetration uh, acceleration will continue and and that's going to benefit a whole lot of companies that are kind of well prepared to to deal with it um on on the low lights look the ones that have been affected are truly offline retail type companies where they just did not have the ability to move everything online and you know are are kind of uh, certain certain ways you know for example if you're an offline apparel company and if apparel is uh, is still predominantly bought despite uh, anand's uh, uh, efforts <laughs> still predominantly but uh, offline you know you, you do have the impact that people are not willing to one you know you're not able to get out and and buy but even then you know you you're seeing that uh, because uh, people are not able to get out uh, you know things are affected so we are seeing as at least in the portfolio we've seen some examples of that or any impulse category if you're in the snacks business and people buy snacks when they're outside or if they buy juices when they are you know traveling all of that has gone away so those have obviously impacted uh, but you know e-commerce has made up a little bit in house consumption has gone up so it's a balance but you know what you lost uh, you know in a month or two can't be gained everything through e-commerce so to that extent um you know the, but it's a wake up call for those companies to go more mainstream e-commerce and and you know adopt technology right so i think that's that's what we've seen i'd say um you know if i look at what to expect uh, uh, you know really just more companies will now make digital core of their thesis versus say i also have a digital arm or i also do e-commerce now this is going to become mainstream in every board meeting i think that's what we have to expect moving forward wonderful dv and, and you know we saw the same at excel as well in, in our portfolio companies uh in the first wave obviously there was a stricter lockdown so there was revenues came crashing down to zero this time it was maybe 40 50% kind of an impact and they are kind of climbing back up very quickly uh and again sort of a larger thrust of moving things online uh and maybe that's a good segue into you know a question for anand uh over the years anand we have seen this uh, you know emergence of d2c brands and maybe just talk to our audience about why is this happening and you know perhaps like the why is it so important also yeah yeah absolutely yeah. so um uh, firstly i think um, while it's been a very difficult two years i do think it's accelerated like gv said uh, digital adoption and consumer behavior change i think is more permanent now some of it will go back of course but a lot of it has changed right uh i think i i'd like to term it abinav digital first brands as opposed to d2c brands because i do think marketplaces in india will continue to be a massive distribution channel uh over the next 10 years uh why i i think the next 10 years will see the emergence of massive digital first brands right uh, i'm also by the way on the board of marico which is a consumer goods company and you can see their transformation into digital first brands happening right so it's not just the new digital first brands that are coming in even the incumbents are waking up to the fact there are three factors that i think are starting to drive this the first is distribution was always the most expensive part about building a brand because you have multi tiered distribution system and you have to put only very select skus through them and it was very expensive the infrastructure investment of flipkart amazon ago mintra nike and others have changed that dramatically you can reach 23000 of the 26000 pin codes in india in 3 days without a lot of cost at 150 rupees right that's dramatically different than what it used to be so i think that's one thing that's changed which encourages experimentation and reach to customers second is i think content just the mobile phone penetration cost of data coming down and therefore being able to talk to customers in a relatively inexpensive way as opposed to big atl advertising and creating content about a brand digitally has become much 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 easier and brands have to have meaning apart from the product consistency they have to have meaning and being able to communicate that meaning has become much much easier the third i think is a little bit more behavioral uh, both entrepreneur and consumer i think the on the entrepreneur side i think the successes of many digital first brands are are encouraging people to do more and more and more of this and therefore there's more experimentation more people coming out with brands etc i think the second is there's a consumer change consumers in india i think as gdp grows one brands with meaning with sustainability which i think james referred to and and several other things and the communication of a complex message becomes much easier through video and and the internet and i think that actually starts to become very very interesting so i think these are the three macro factors that are driving it i frankly think i mean e-commerce is at its infancy right 35 billion dollars today you know my sense is over the next 10 years it'll be 700 800 billion dollars india is moving in almost every sector from unbranded to branded so emergence of 100 million plus brands 
I think will happen a lot, lot, lot more. And I think it's a very exciting phase to be an entrepreneur and doing a digital first brand. I don't think you can take off offline. Offline is still the majority of the market. That's why I keep saying digital first. I think offline brands will become more digital savvy. And I think online brands will start to think about an interesting omni approach where you have a one view of customer and you use and you use it also to make the brand more real. Right. So I think it's a, it's a very exciting time. And I think that's what's driving this digital first brands. That's that's awesome. And, and Anant, on that point of multiple 100 million brands, so, so you see a lot of these brands uh, or, or you see, you know, some some large umbrella of brands under like one company. So do you see an aggregation play uh, as the way forward or you see, uh, you know, yeah. individual brands standing out? Uh, well, I clearly believe in. I the can't put word in your mouth clearly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, I would say a little bit of both. I mean, is my sense. Um, uh, if I look at it today, there are roughly about four thousand brands in roughly the lifestyle. If you take out electronics, if you take apparel, beauty, personal care, uh, home, right? You have four thousand plus brands between five crores and seventy crores in revenue, right? Uh, now, uh, if you think about this, a lot of these brands will continue to remain subscale till they get to 100, 150 crores. So the aggregation play is very interesting because you can bring the talent, the capital, the technology savvy into subscale brands and therefore accelerate them at the portfolio level. So I do think aggregation plays, which is what Mensa is trying to do, I think will absolutely be a large part of it. That said, by the way, I think there are now sufficiently fairly large brands that will also continue to independently do it. So. I suspect that there is going to be an aggregation and tuck-in by large brands as well as they acquire smaller brands. So I think both these phenomenons will happen. The reason I think both is very good for the ecosystem is one is I think the consumer experience will improve. You'll get better products. And I think even for the marketplaces, uh, the, the, the catalog, if you will, and the quality of the catalog will continue to improve and become better. Right. So, uh, and I think what the aggregation also allows is a little bit more investment in R and D and product development, which I think the previous panel spoke about. Right. So you can invest in marketing, you can invest in product development because you have a portfolio that actually can can do this. That's very helpful, uh, Rishika. Uh, we talked about D two C brands, uh, especially in India. You have a lot of experience in uh, you know investing in D two C brands. Maybe it's with flavor of sort of building in India and and going global. Uh, can you help our audience understand sort of you know, how you think about this? Yeah, so I think I think what's what's you know the sort of trends that we're seeing as we look at D two C brands emerge both in India and Southeast Asia are like you know as as Anand and James mentioned that there is a huge active awareness and focus around sustainability uh, of any shape or form, right? It could be it could be uh, clean products, it could be sustainably sourced products, so on and so forth. And I think that is something that the customer is very actively seeking now. So if you do consumer surveys, what you will see is there's obviously a price quality uh, uh, you know, sort of requirement, but then the but then the third requirement on those surveys is now is now talking about sustainability. So I think I think that is something that we're seeing emerging as a very active trend. I think the other trend that we're seeing, like you mentioned, is this whole make in India, but make for the world. Um, you know, we are seeing a lot of skincare, personal care, beauty care kind of brands that are emerging in India, but are building quality, um, you know, which, which, can, which can sell at a global scale and at very attractive prices just because, you know, in India, we've got that advantage. So. Um, and this is just across the board. I'm sure you know all of us are, are aware of several brands that have launched in you know inside the Southeast Asian and Middle Eastern markets. And we're also seeing brands go to the US now, um, you know, through Amazon, etc. And I think that's a very, very exciting space because the one question that most investors struggle with in India is that is there a barrier to scale for some of these brands, uh, you know, beyond beyond a certain revenue threshold. And I think uh, one way to circumvent that is to think: Is your product ready for international markets? Right? Can you can you can you can you build a portfolio that not only increases your lifetime value in India, but also allows you to sort of become a more global product? So I think that is also a very interesting trend. And just relating to this, you know, I think the third trend that we're seeing is that most direct-to-consumer brands are now focusing less on CAC and more on loyalty. Uh, and I think that the next eight to 10 years of brand building will really focus around how do you build customer loyalty? How do you, you know, how do you build that, that whole lifetime value? How do you build longevity with your customer, whether it's assortment, whether it's just frequency of purchases, whatever that might be. I think trying to focus only on CAC um, and trying to sort of uh, believe that we will get profitable 
and we will be able to recover CAC after, you know, uh, after we reach a certain critical mass. Rather than that, I think founders are now thinking the other way around that it's allowing them to increase a CAC threshold as they think about loyalty. Um, so I, th I think those are those are some of the trends that we're seeing as we as we look at direct to consumer brands in India and Southeast Asia. Shikha, that's very, very helpful. Um, maybe just a follow-up question there. A any examples that come to mind, whether in your portfolio or outside, who have maybe you know done this well? For instance, somebody who's done better on loyalty versus you know just focusing on CAC or or maybe just going global just for the audience so that they can take some real examples yeah. uh, you know, for them. Sure, sure. So I think I think the best example of an Indian company going global in our portfolio is Lift Space. Uh, uh, you know, so LiveSpace obviously started as a company focused on the Indian market, has very quickly moved to Singapore, is, is doing extremely well, growing, growing rapidly, and is now also expanding to other geographies outside, right, within Southeast Asia and beyond as well. So I, we've also seen that in Lenskart, uh, you know, where they've also opened Southeast Asia, um, uh, you know, and, 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 and there are many such, such examples across insurance, et cetera, also where, you know, companies are looking at, at expanding to markets outside of India, right? So I think that's on the whole global um, India to sort of global. Um, I think around loyalty, you know, there are some interesting models that um, we're coming across in Southeast Asia, where uh, you know you have you have companies that are operating in very traditional segments, like say for example apparel, uh, but are really playing beautifully on the whole loyalty angle, on omni-channel experience, um, uh, you know, on sort of customer delight. Uh, all of which is tying in into actually much lower CACs. So, you know, without taking names, but for example, there's a company in Southeast Asia that, um, you know, through, through Omnichannel has actually observed that customers uh, who, are, who are their loyalty customers are actually spending three and a half times more than they would if they were only on the online channel. So, uh, you know, so I think, I think these kind of loyalty programs and offering an Omnichannel overall experience really, really helps improve stickiness. Right. And I think right. I think sorry, and and I think we've we've seen that in traditional sectors like airlines, uh, etc. In the past, right, yeah. where when there's no brand differentiation, you sort of tend to build loyalty as a differentiation. So just ex extrapolating that into into in, uh, into the segment. Got it. No, I think that's very very helpful, and those examples are again sort of you know very actionable, and, and people can use that. Switching gears a little bit, uh, and I know we are coming up on time, but you know, GV, I need to ask this question to you. Uh, we, we have seen in the last couple of years, uh, while there is a massive adoption on the digital side, uh, you know, Sequoia has been part of many distribution led, uh, you know, companies. And so, so we'd love to understand sort of, you know, how, what's the, what's the thesis here? How do you guys think about it? Um, and it's kind of important, uh, you know, the question is coming from a place where, you know, it is very, very important to connect people so that they can come on a platform and transact or do something. But how do you think about this investor? So it's a great question, Abhinav. Um, and it's one that is somewhat less obvious because you know many of these companies actually don't monetize for a long period of time. And you know, seemingly the valuations keep going up, and people are like, look, how are these companies, you know, get so so valuable? I think the thing to remember is uh, you know, in in the past there was this whole sales driven approach to kind of monetization where you know there are customers out there, and then how do you find either the offline distribution or the sales-led approach to get to them and monetize it? Now, you know, some of the startups, what they have done is really just turned it around the head and said, look, my product becomes the selling proposition, right? Can I drive product-led growth, which, which basically, you know, not just in the consumer space, but even in the software space broadly, um, you know, or selling to SMEs or MSMEs, it's, it's like saying, okay, look, can I treat the B2B, the business I'm selling to as a consumer, and can I create a way for me to distribute this product almost like a consumer product? Where the product is the hero, uh, and then you know people are coming to it, uh, you know, uh, and and so that thinking where product like both where my product is the key proposition, and then you know which eases out the friction, and a lot of people adopt me. For example, something like Kata Book, which uh, you guys may be aware of, it's a it's a small, uh, very small entrepreneur uh, kind of platform where people come there because they're just doing what they used to do in pen and paper under register. They're moving that regular Kata of what I should be given or what I owe other people to a very simple app, right? That was, that was a simple product, which, you know, because the product was so simple, they started seeing millions of uh, traders and shopkeepers, et cetera, download it and start adopting it, right? Now that was the wedge. It's a small wedge that gives you the presence and a connection to the, to the user. Now, because it was so integral to how they kept track of payables and receivables, et cetera, that became a very sticky product. 
behind which they built a bunch of new modules and now a bunch of new monetization levers, where if there is a large distribution of customers that you've acquired through a wedge, and if you have a highly engaged customer base, now you have the opportunity to kind of build more for them and then eventually monetize what you build, right? So that's just one example, but this is also what people are trying to do when you talk about content community commerce. You're creating a platform and a distribution where consumers are coming to you, and then you kind of create stickiness through a community and then eventually you launch a private label and, and monetize it. So these are all different forms of saying distribution first, but essentially, uh, if you were to step back and think about it, it's really saying, look, if you if you take today's world, what skills are hard to find? It is really this whole digital uh, you know, growth hacking and ability to kind of get up to a lot of consumers. If you have that as the core strength, then I can hire the consumer, uh, you know, brand person. I can hire the, you know, formulation person. I can, I can bring people that can help me monetize it. That is a well understood science in a set of people that already do it. That industry exists and the talent exists. So if you can be the uh, creator of the wedge that allows you a large amount of distribution, then you know people have figured out how to monetize that engagement. base. So that's the thesis, and I think uh, uh, you know it's so far been working working really well because. Um, you know, like I said, the talent for the other stuff is more widely available than the people that can actually build this distribution first models. Understood. Very, very helpful to hear uh, that thesis, uh, GV. Uh, we are coming up on time. So, so just a quick wrap, you know, we, we hear that more and more people are coming uh, online. Uh, you know, digitization is clearly happening in the SME sector. Uh, we have emergence of D2C brands. And so if you are working in any other space, any other sector, uh, don't and join uh, either the startup community <laughs> or this digital or, or or become a vc just like us uh, and you know come uh, come be an operator uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and if you have like real detailed questions then you can you can go to the organizers uh, organizers here let's here and ask them some more insights and you know detailed questions but thanks gv thanks anant and uh, thanks rishika and thanks everyone thank you, uh, thank you. Very nice thanks, thanks abhinav thanks everyone bye